they spur you on to discover what it means to practice God's presence in your life. So to start this journey through what the Bible has taught um, about practicing the presence of God, uh, I'd like to set out some biblical truths about the presence of God that I have set as my foundation and I will tie in throughout this time we have together. I will be digging into a ton of different scriptures today. So if you have a Bible, or you have the Bible I brought up, feel free to get it out so you can follow along. The first point that I'm going to be talking about today is um, one that many of us probably don't even think about because it's so ingrained in who we are. Um, it's the presence of God is in Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him? Declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Declares the Lord. Um, God's presence is not limited to an area or a space or a building or a time period. Um, it is not limited to a temple as it was in the Old Testament. Um, we can see through Jesus' death and resurrection that we have unlimited access to God no matter where. In Matthew 27, 51, he talks about the temple curtain being torn from top to bottom, saying to find that the presence of God is now available for all of humanity. In Acts 17, 24, it reiterates that again. It said, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. Second point, second truth that I build this entire um, my life really on is that as a believer, I have unlimited access to his presence because he is omnipresent. Um, Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3, and 7 and 11, 7 through 11 say this. God is our refuge and strength, and ever present to help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. As a believer, this verse is one of many throughout scripture, promising God's presence with us even when we can't hear. Um, Webster's Dictionary defines omnipresence this way. Omnipresence is the state of being widespread or constantly encountered. Uh, I believe that is exactly who God is. Take a look at that first verse again. If you have your Bible, if you don't, I'll read it again. God is our refuge and strength and ever present to help in trouble. <clears throat> what this means is that God isn't sort of present, He isn't half of present distracted or distant or uninvolved presently. Um, he is an ever-present one, always there, regardless of how we feel, regardless of how we um, view him, he is always present. God is with us in our lostness and trouble. He's with us when the darkness seems to be staying longer than we think it should. He's with us when my confusion clouds my understanding of him. He's always there. When I was looking into this omnipresence, I went to God questions about the Lord, and I found a great article that outlines the omnipresence of God so well. Here's a part of what they wrote. Just hold on, it's quite a moment. God is naturally present in every aspect of the natural order of things, in every manner of time and place. God is actively present in a different way in every event in history, as a provident guide of human affairs. God is in a special way, attentively present to those who call on his name, to those who inter intercede for others, who adore God, who petition, and who pray earnestly for forgiveness. And supremely, he is present in the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and mystically present in the universal church that covers the earth and against which the gates of hell will not prevail. The third piece of my foundation fits right in beside the second. As a Christian, God's presence is a constant. So not only is he omnipresent and everywhere, but he's constantly everywhere. It doesn't change based on our feelings or our perception of God or even our obedience. And to this I'm going to turn to my favorite psalm, which is Psalm 139. I'm going to read that for you guys. I'm going to go through verse 1 through 
verses 1 through 12. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. I could spend the next 45 minutes just going over this chapter, because it is one of my favorites in the Bible. And for the fact that it speaks so clearly about the presence of God not being like a, something that you can put a box in. Um, for those of you who have spent any more amount of time around me, whether that's on the worship team or just in general life, you've probably heard me say before that one of my favorite things about God is that I can't explain anything about him. Um, and I think this verse puts it clearly. David feels the same way. He doesn't understand the presence of God. He doesn't understand how it can be everywhere. He just knows that it's, regardless of what he does, regardless of where he goes, God is. The Amplified Version uh, says it a little bit differently. Um, it says, it adds stuff to the verses, and it says, O Lord, you have searched me thoroughly and have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, my entire life, everything I do, you understand my thoughts from afar. So think about this for a second. God knows every single thought you've ever thought, you ever will think. Nothing goes unnoticed and nothing is missed. All of the good and all of the bad. And yet he promises never to leave us or forsake us. That blows my mind. As a human, I make mistakes. I am a dad, and I am not a perfect dad. My son, too young to attest to it, but my wife could attest to it, that I am far from a perfect father. And the fact that I get unlimited access to God, even though I mess up and I do things wrong on a daily basis, is like, it's incredible. I just can't do anything but think. His, he promises to never leave us or forsake us, and he does not pull away, he doesn't grow distant from the sin, or have intrusive thoughts or temptations. His presence is constant. God, who gives the free gift of salvation and eternal life to spend with him forever, does not offer that gift with the condition that we must keep a pure heart and mind constantly for the rest of our lives. He gives his gift to us knowing we would mess up, knowing our sinful nature, and yet he still chose me. He still chose to love me. He still chose to love each and every one of you guys. I love that. That is, that, that fact could keep me going forever. And the fourth truth that I set as my foundation is this. God's presence is for our benefit. His presence is life and freedom. It's not suppression or burden. Acts 17, 27 through the beginning of 28 says, God did this so they would seek him perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God is life. Never far away, and he's our life, our existence. Second Corinthians 3.17 says now, the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I've talked to many, many different people, and some people feel the same as being where God's presence is life, and God's presence is life-giving, and other people feel like the omnipresence presence of God is a heaviness. Like someone looking over their shoulder and shaking their head every time we mess up or disappoint. And that is not true, and I could spend the rest of our time together just going over that specifically, um, but I won't. Instead, I'm going to read one more verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup over me. Does anybody know where that verse is from? It's Psalm 23, which is on the paper in front of me. 
Um, the ever popular Psalm 23, you guys have probably heard it dozens and dozens of times. It's quoted so often. And I remember memorizing this chapter as a little kid and stopping after verse 4 and almost blowing through verse 5, this verse here, to get to verse 6 where the feel good stuff that I understand is at. But I don't want to miss, and I want us to miss the impact of this verse. What does this verse say? Would someone just be able to read off the paper or something and reread that verse for me? Thank you. So listen to that. God prepares a grand feast showing wealth and power, and he does it in the presence of my enemies. This is why that verse is so important to me, and I didn't realize this until last year. When God prepares this meal, he is showing the enemies of your soul, my soul, who it is that takes care of you. He is showing that when they come against you, they will have to answer to him. In the midst of my temptation, and when the enemies are bold enough to come out of the shadows, God stands in front of me, he stands in front of you, and he provides nourishment, and pours into you so you are overflowing. I wish I would have learned this when I was five. It took me until I was 26 years old to realize that. All right, so those are some of the foundational truths about God's presence that I've set as my foundation. And to be honest, they kind of put me in my place. I am one of billions of humans who have walked this planet. And yet I, Daniel, have direct access to the presence of God. It reminds me of the chorus of one of my favorite songs. What a wondrous thing I can stand to sing because when I fall to my knees, you're the one who pulls me up again. What a mystery that you notice me, and in a crowd of 10,000, you don't miss a thing. That song has gotten me through a lot in my life. That song is called You Don't Miss a Thing. It's by Bethel. And that one. Sorry. Like, I'm just remembering all the good times I've had in that song. I spent last December going over this idea of God's presence and asking God's question, God a bunch of questions and seeking out biblical answers to my questions. Um, one of the questions that I ask God during this time frame is why? Why would God draw us? So, before I attempt to answer that or show you kind of what, how God answered that to me, um, I'm going to pick up my brother because he's in the front row. Uh, this is Timothy, everybody. He's my brother. And Timothy is engaged, which means he chose to spend time with somebody. Because, no, and at least a little bit, probably because of what that person gives back to him. Right? Whenever he's around this person, he gets happy because he likes the way they look, or he likes the way that they make him feel, or the way that they make food, or whatever it is about them. He gets something in return by enjoying their presence, right? I think we all have this with our friends, with our family, whatever it is. There are people that when we're around, we get something from that interaction. And sometimes sometimes there are times where you may have to be that person to give. Every relationship, as you probably have all heard, no relationship is 50-50. It's all giving 100%, 100% of the time. Um, but sometimes you have to pull your weight, right? And you have to be the one that's doing the giving. And other times, you are the one that's getting the receiving. And it's a benefit to you. This is what God um, spoke to me back in December. God doesn't relate to the world because he lacks something within himself. For me, when I got married, I was lacking a partner. I was lacking somebody to share my life with. Um, that's not the sole reason why I got married. It's definitely a reason why I got married. I was lacking a partner. There's a hole there, and now Dana fills that for me. Rather, God draws near out of his abundance. Creation doesn't satisfy a deficiency. His interaction with humanity is born out of an abundance of love and grace. When I seek someone's presence, I can be needing something from them. But this is never the case when God draws near. His selfless love only wants to pour out on us. It's a completely selfless attitude, all the time. 
Another biggest question that I asked God, and this is one that I spent weeks diving over, was if I believe these truths about God, if I believe that he's always here, if I believe he's always present, if I believe that regardless of what I do, he is still here with me all the time. And if believers, as believers, we have access to him, then why doesn't he stop us from experiencing hardship and loss? Why doesn't he keep me from sinning? Why doesn't he keep temptation? Why can't all of that just go away? I've been correlating the presence of God with no problems, looking at God's presence as a shield from anything that I've perceived as bad or not for my benefit. And sometimes life gets hard. How many of you have had something happen to you in the past year that you didn't like, that was hard? Right? Probably all of us in this room. How many in the past month? Past week? Like most of us, right? And you don't have to raise your hand for this. Um, but in the past year, how many of you guys have sinned? All of us, right? In the past month, again, in the past week, in the past 24 hours, the answer is we've all done. Why doesn't God's presence, which is here all the time, never it's a constant, why doesn't it stop these things from happening to us? God led me to Judges, which I have read once through before and never really spent time studying, but he led me to Judges 3, verses 1 through 4. Um, I'm going to read it. There's a couple names of people and places in here, so I probably will butcher them, so please forgive me. Um, but verses 1 through 4 say this. There are, these are the nations that the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had any previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, and the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath. They were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given to their ancestors through Moses. God wanted the Israelites to be ready, not to become weak and unprepared for battle due to a lack of enemies. He wanted them to be tested and ready for defending themselves, rather than let them grow weak under a lack of the Lord gave them opportunities to stay ready. God's presence doesn't mean a life of comfort, a life of ease. I guarantee you that the Israelites were complaining about how God didn't just wipe all their enemies off the face of the earth. I too have found myself looking back, complaining, comparing my spiritual battles to what I feel should be the normal amount of trials, the normal amount of testing, the normal amount of temptation. And I've asked God, why me? For instance, um, I, how many of you know what a stock is? All right, for those of you who don't, imagine a pimple on your eyelid. It's very painful, and I get them from time to time. I hadn't had one in close to two years. Two weeks ago, I got my first one in two years. And usually I get one, and then maybe six or seven or eight months later, a year later, I get another. Well, I got another one on Wednesday. And here I'm thinking, why? Three days before Spark, three days before I'm supposed to give a talk, are you giving me another one of these things that never show up in my life and haven't showed up in two years? Like, why me? I literally sat in the bathroom going, why me? <laughs> and then I went back to this, and I was like, okay, God, I see what I have asked God that why me way more times than I'd like to admit, and I put myself at the center of that equation. It's an incredibly prideful mindset that I'm not wrong. But boy, has it made for many humbling moments. How many of you have seen the TikTok or Instagram short about God giving his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers? Soldiers? Yeah? Um, well, I want to challenge that joke by shifting the focus. When God allows a battle, what am I not seeing? I'm 
probably not looking to it as an opportunity to grow you. But what else? Here is one of the truth bombs that God showed me when I was asking him why he doesn't stop me from temptation. God is always present, and I will never know all of the temptations and battles he has turned back from me to keep me from being overwhelmed. All I see is the ones that get through. I'm not in the throne room of God every time my enemy asks, can I do this today? All I see is the ones that he allows. A couple years ago, Pastor Jerry gave a um, sermon on the book of Job. And in the book of Job, Job comes to God over and over and over again. And he's like, dude, why? And to be fair, I think Job had a reason. Everything in his life was incredible. And then God was like, poof, it's gone. And it talks about how Satan went into the throne room of God, and he's like, hey, can I do this? Because if you do this, if I do this to Job, he'll stop leaving. And God was like, yeah, sure, you do your best, see what happens. And so Job comes to God, and he's like, dude, like, why? I had everything, and now I, I literally have nothing. All of my friends are telling me, like, I should denounce you. What, what's the point of this? At the end of Job, and I don't have the exact verse, but God says, who do you think that you are? And he puts Job in his place. He reminds Job that he has such a small view. Job knows his life probably better than anybody else who's walked the earth. But he doesn't know his life better than God. I can have such a puny view of actual reality. Looking at my problems and moping around. But shifting my focus from my problems to God's point of view is a mighty perspective shift. My misunderstanding of what God's presence brought to me has caused me to miss Him in my moments of darkness and at the times of my walk with Jesus when my emotions had left me empty. Instead of looking for His presence and focusing on Him in the valleys, I was only focused on looking for a way out. Sometimes I am so fixated on what I think God sounds like or feels like or what I think His answer should be that I can miss him actually communicating with me. This is why practicing his presence on a daily basis is so vitally important. A biblical example of missing God or looking for him where he wasn't, I found in 1 Kings 19, which is where God brings Elijah up on a mountain to be in his presence. And this is what verses 11 through 13 says. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake there came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out to and stood at the mountain. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God's presence wasn't in the incredible feats of power. Instead, it was in the gentle whisper. I put myself in Elijah's shoes on that mountain, and I think of how I might have been so caught up in that incredible earthquake or the giant fire that I had just seen that I very well could have missed God's presence. I can get so close-minded and rigid in my listening skills and miss his voice when I'm focused on getting a specific answer or when I think that this is only how God speaks to me and I can miss what he's actually trying to speak to me. That is why spending daily time in his presence is so important to me personally and for everybody who calls themselves a believer. Without it, I can miss that still small voice when I'm asking for the loud and thunderous answer. Um, quick little illustration of that. Um, as I said, I'm married and I have a kid. And one of um, one of my wife's biggest struggles is hearing the voice of God. And so um, we are expecting our second. And with that comes 
a lot of morning sickness, and a lot of things that are not exciting. And over and over, Dana will say, I just want this to go away. I wish he would just take this away. And then he will answer that prayer, and he'll take it away. And then she'll be like, is the baby OK? I was OK. Is the baby going to be OK? Like, I wish I was feeling sick. And then God would bring the sickness back. And she'd be like, oh, I don't like this. I wish I would feel bad. And he'd take it away. And then she'd be like, is the baby OK? I hope the baby's OK. And I had a conversation with her, because both of us were doing this. Like, I was praying that she would feel better, too. And, and then I was like, I pray that she gets sick again, I don't know. And I talked with her and I was like, honey, like, God is answering you. You don't like the answer he's giving you because it's actually not what you wanted, but he's giving you the answer. You just, like, either stop asking him for those things because he obviously is giving you it, or, like, change your mindset. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it's, it's important to have the right mindset, and it's important to not be focused on what you think an answer should be, because then you could completely miss what God is actually trying to teach you, potentially through that situation. And when we have such a small view of what's really going on, um, I can find myself not being careful asking God these questions. And if he is always present, and I have promised to have access to his presence at all times, then, like I asked earlier, why does he allow bad things to happen? Why do I still struggle with sin? I think we went back to that earlier um, passage in Judges. Part of it is to test me. Part of it is to keep me ready. If I didn't deal with any sort of hardship or temptations or anything for years, as soon as the first one hit, what would happen to my my faith would be built on good feelings and happy vibes and everything like that. And then when the first bad thing happened, more often than not, I would say my life would probably crumble. Because what I had, my view on God's presence was that it's correlating with all good things. Which is not true. We can see this um, a little bit more clearly in the New Testament as well. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Jesus did not promise his disciples that everything would be easy and easy for them. In fact, just the opposite. He promised that they would have trials in this world. In John 16.33, which in my Bible is written in red letters, which means that Jesus actually said it, he said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. I found this really good article, also on GodQuestions.org, that goes into a ton of detail on this topic um, about how, as believers, we struggle with the enemy's attacks. Um, there's one topic that says probably better than I ever could what it was, so I, I'll share it with you guys as well. The author of this page, when I, it, I think I just typed in, like, why does God let good things happen to bad, or bad things happen to good people? Um, it says, in many ways, it is after a person is saved that the struggle against sin really heats up in his life. All people are born with a nature that is bent towards sin, which is why children do not need to be taught how to misbehave. That comes naturally. Trust me. I know from personal experience. When a person is converted, the sin nature does not disappear, and so the internal conflict begins in the life of the now I will read the last half of John 16, 33. After it says, in this world of tribulation, it says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Keep in mind here that Paul is talking to believers and that he knows that God's constant presence is truth. He knows that it also does not promise a life that's free of temptation or sin. And sadly, because of the fallen world we live in, temptation is a part of our life. I wish that God would have promised to protect me from every temptation and sin, but no matter 
how hard I look through this book, that verse does not exist. Now remember what I said earlier about God's presence being for our benefit? Well, his presence is life and freedom, all that stuff. That is still 100% true. And even when we give in to the temptations of this world, and when we live in sin, or when we sin, uh, because we are human, God does not use his presence to bring shame. He does not use his presence to bring guilt, or heaviness, or sorrow. Let me read Jesus' own words that talk directly to what his presence offers in those moments. Matthew 11, 28-30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. His presence is life. His presence brings rest and refreshes our weary souls. When I'm feeling exhausted just from being alive, I can come to him. He wants me to bring my burdens and my gross baggage to him. I spent all of last year studying through the Psalms, and over and over, chapter after chapter, the idea of the presence of God was incredibly evident. And the more I read, the more I found the psalmist referring to God's presence. Here are some of my favorite times um, that God's presence is mentioned in the first handful of Psalms. Psalm 3 says that the Lord's presence is a shield around me, calming my fears and delivering me from my enemies. Psalm 7 says that his presence is my refuge and my shield, willingly coming to my aid and fighting my battles for me. Psalm 17 says that his presence causes righteousness and satisfaction. His, in his presence we are tested Corrected, which brings about righteousness. Psalms 23, which we'll get to a little later. The Lord is my shepherd. His presence guides me and restores me, leading me on paths of righteousness. And Psalm 27 says, His presence is my life and salvation, goodness for me today and forever. Now what I don't want you to hear or take from all these verses is that the presence of God is the absence of struggle, hardship, of sin, and temptation, and anything else that you would consider bad or evil. I think we just went over that. I think it's pretty clear that that is not the case. Um, nowhere in the Bible does it say that, and that anything about God's presence is being directly correlated to a constant, happy, emotional state or a stress-free life. Um, in fact, reading through many of the Psalms, I found that David crying out to the Lord during the time of hardship and reminding his souls of the truth of God's presence. This is also clear throughout the entirety of the Bible that God's presence and nearness is not seen or felt only by humans. I thought I was going to have a little more time than I am, so I'm actually going to do the handout at the end that you guys can take home and practice for yourselves. Um, I was going to talk about Psalm 23 and how it rocked my view of God. I mean, I will go into that a little bit, um, but what I'm going to do here, and what I'd like you all to do with me, is could you just turn to Psalm 22 for me? And for time's sake, I'm not going to read the entire psalm, because it is 31 verses long, and there's a lot of words. But what I will do is, as you guys have it in front of you on your phone or on your, um, in your Bible or whatever it is, I just want you to look at it. And on, in my Bible, um, it's kind of broken up into sections here. There's verses 1 and 2, and then I have 3 through 5, and then I have 6 through 11, and really all the way down 6 through 18, and then 19 through 21, and then 22 through the end of the chapter. And one reason why I loved reading through the Psalms is I loved the vulnerability and the real emotion that I could feel through David's writing. David wasn't, we're, we're reading David's like personal journal. Like if I were to just give you this book, which was my Psalm journal last year, you would see good times, you would see bad times, you would see me asking God questions, you would see him answering me. You would see all of that, just like you saw in David. Um, David is much more than that probably had better handwriting, so you don't want to look at this, but it's the same idea. And in Psalm 22, I love how it just shows David 
talking out something, and then him talking to his soul. And I think that you can see this in the first two verses. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh God, I cry out by day, but you don't answer by night, and I am not silent. And then verses 3 and 4, he steps into a different mindset in 5 2. He says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One of Israel. You are the praise of Israel. And you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried, and you were saved. You, they trusted, and were not disappointed. Here, David understands. David understands that God's presence isn't all happiness. But he also understands that, like, this is a bad time. I'm not enjoying this, Lord. Where are you? And he has to remind his soul of who God really was. And then in verses 6 through 18, goes into David pretty much saying, like, the struggle is real. Like, this is not fun. Then he gets into 19 through 21, where he asks God for help. He cries out to the Lord. And then, in verses 22 through the end of the chapter, he's reminding himself to praise God. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of your descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Practicing the presence of God is, as I've said many times, it is incredibly important to understanding what the presence really is. It is vital to understanding that when you have a bad day, it's not because God's not there. When you have a fantastic day, that doesn't mean God is closer to you. Sometimes, actually, it's the opposite. Sometimes God feels, can, can feel, can be closer in those moments where you're, you're struggling or when you're having a hard day because he's there to comfort you. And I've had moments in my life where my life has been, like, I felt incredibly far from God. A quick example was when I was, in December, I was going through this, right? Um, me and Coffee don't have a great relationship. And what I mean by that is me and Kathy don't have a great relationship. I don't drink coffee, which means when I drink coffee, I don't sleep. And that just means I'm old, for you guys who don't understand that thing. Um, and one night I was like, oh, you know, my mom made, or my, my mom, my wife made these incredible brownies. It's not the first time I've done that. Um, and the brownies had a little bit of espresso. Like, I'm talking an entire sheet of brownies had, like, a half of a teaspoon of espresso in it. And I was like, that one's going to I'm going to have a brownie before I go to bed. Six hours later, I was still trying to go to bed. And that has been something that's happened many, many times throughout my um, journey into adulthood. But during that night, normally on a night like that, I would lie up in bed and I'd be scrolling through Instagram or I'd be downloading the newest game out of the app store to see if it could cure my insomnia, and it never works. Um, back in December, like I said, I was reading through this, so I was practicing the presence of God on a daily basis, and at 2.30, I heard this still small voice that said, just spend time with me. I was like, what are you it's 2.30 in the morning, dude. Like, I'm trying to go to sleep. I literally, I had like a adverse reaction to the voice of God. About an hour later, again I heard it. Dude, just spend time with me. And I was like, no, it's 3.30. I should be getting close to this point. I'm sure I can't be up in caffeine forever. 4 a.m. came along, and again I heard the voice of the Lord say, spend time with me. And so I went into my office, and an hour and a half passed. And then I was able to go to sleep. But that hour and a half, I would have never spent that hour and a half I hadn't been spending time continuously earlier on in the month of December, spending time understanding him, getting to know him, practicing his presence, so I heard his voice. Like I said, that was not the first time I had been done with my caffeine intake, but that was the first time I heard his voice late at night, and I said, okay, I was struggling at first, but okay. Practicing the presence of God is has been and continues to be, like I said earlier, the number one health indicator for my spiritual walk, my emotional well-being, and my ability to interact socially. And what I would like to give you guys as a parting gift 
is that piece of paper. Uh, if you didn't get it, it's just Psalm 23 with some lines on the other side. Um, and to close our time together, I'm going to just show you guys um, what I did last year and um, give you the opportunity to replicate this in your own words. Last year I went through the first 120 psalms. Just kidding, 118, because 19 is the most. Yeah, so I skipped out on 119. Um, and I rewrote them in my own words in what was impacting me that day. Whatever I was going through, that's what I wrote. And I'm going to read you guys what Psalm 23 meant to me back at the beginning of 2022. And I want to encourage you guys to take some time, whether it's today, later this week, later this month, later this year, whatever it is, spend some time with the Lord going through and rewriting His Word and making it applicable to yourself. Spend that time practicing His presence. This is what the Lord is going to the Lord is the shepherd of my soul. I am never in need. He gives me peaceful sleep in great pastures, except for on that one day in December, but we'll talk about that. Um, leading me to calm streams of waters, all the while restoring my soul. The Lord is my guide to the way of righteousness, because his name is great. Even though my life is filled with highs and lows, when I walk through the valley of darkness and death, I can have assurance of Jesus, so I will not be afraid. He is with me, guiding me with his rod and staff, which comfort my mind. God, you prepare a feast before me in the presence of those who hate me, showing me, showing them who stands behind me. You have called and chosen me as your anointed one, and you fill my cup to overflowing so I can pour into others. I am confident in this, that your goodness and mercy and love will go before me and behind me all of my living days. And I have been given access to live, to abide in the house of God because of your, your great mercy and love. You pour out so much love on me that is unmerited and I am unworthy, which is why your love is so pure. You show me how to love with a purity that is not based on what someone else does. You show me true love and I can count on you to always be here for me. That's all I got. Um, thank you guys for listening.